It's my pleasure to introduce uh, our today's speaker, uh, Kasia Ronczak from Wrocław University of Science and Technology. Uh, Kasia, among other things, is a specialist in uh, theory of uh, quantum dots and in applications of uh, quantum information theory to quantum, uh, to quantum dots. Uh, she has been also working in, in, in theory of, um, uh, of uh, Discord and obviously in, in uh, open quantum systems theory as well. And today she will uh, tell us about the measure of fluid entanglement, fluid environment entanglement for pure deflating evolutions. So we will have uh, open system theory today. Kasia, the ground is yours. Thank you. Um, okay, so somehow I cannot start the seminar without a talk without reading the title, so I will read it again. Uh, I will be talking, I will show you a measure um, which is specially tailored for qubit environment entanglement in case of evolutions, joint evolutions which lead to pure dephasing of the qubit. And this is a work which was actually done just by me here here at, at in Wrocław. And the outline of the talk is as follows. I will start off with a slightly rambling in introduction. And then I will show you uh, what class of problems I'm studying. Um, and everything I will show you afterwards is going to be limited to this class of problems. Then I will very briefly show you uh, the results on which I will be building everything, which is a qubit entanglement, uh, qubit environment entanglement witness, which we found with Łukasz Cywiński some time ago. And using this witness, I will propose an entanglement measure, again, for a qubit in an environment in this pure dephasing, with this pure dephasing Hamiltonian. And as quickly as possible, I will show you that this entanglement measure, as long as we are within this pure, the class of density matrices, which you can have, uh, which you can obtain with these types of interactions, then it has, um, it is an entanglement measure. It has the, the right properties and also has a maximum value. And then I will try to annoy you a little bit. At least I did manage to annoy quite a bit the, the, the referees. It's still them that, that are wrong. And then I will show you why if you do have um, this type of Hamiltonian, it's a good idea to use, um, to use this measure. And I will show you some exemplary evolutions um, for an environment of non-interacting spins. So the introduction, as I said, is, is a little bit rambling, um, and I will be restating stuff which you probably all know very well, if not better than I do. Um, but so starting off, there is a problem with understanding on, a, let's say, an intuitive level with the intuition you ga gain after studying physics for a really long time. What does it mean? if a mixed state is entangled. It's actually in general already kind of vague when you just look at pure state entanglement, but then you can at least say something like that, like that a state is entangled. This means that there is information about the joint system state which you cannot acquire from the density matrices which uh, describe each of the subsystems separately. But once you get into mixed entangled states, um, those are states which there's a pretty phrase that they cannot be created by local operations and classical communications, classical communication. But when, once you start looking up what it actually means that it turns out that it's mathematically pretty vague and you can only say, uh, restate this in a, in a uh, not vague mathematical way, uh, mathematical way once you have separable um, once your state is uh, created from product initial states then then these separable operations are exactly what I would imagine uh, well, to be local separable operations just acting on one system and then it makes sense so 
in general, these things, things simply get complicated, and especially that I'm studying a, an asymmetric system where we have a qubit, which is my system of interest, and an environment which can be arbitrarily, arbitrarily large, then in general, it's, it's, it's really hard to, to specify what we mean more. But if you have the type of qubit and environment evolutions, which can only lead to pure dephasing of the qubit after you trace out the environment, then at least for the pure state, there is a really nice and particularly meaningful interpretation of entanglement. That entanglement is strictly connected with the amount of information about the qubit, which has sort of leaked out into the environment. And then for pure state, this entanglement has a one-to-one -one correspondence with decoherence, uh, but that's sort of a side note. So quite recently, I'm getting old, so five years old, five years ago is quite recently, we showed with Wokash that for mixed states, this information transfer is also necessary for pure dephasing to be accompanied by entanglement. You can have pure dephasing, which is not accompanied by entanglement at all. So this link between decoherence and entanglement uh, becomes much smaller. But still, if you have entanglement generating it between your system and your environment during pure dephasing, this means that at least to some point, you can read out your qubit state by measuring your environment. Uh, so I'm not going to be trying to, to do anything general with this. I'm definitely going to have only a certain type of interactions which can lead to pure dephasing. And the idea is that since there is this correlation between entanglement and information transfer, so maybe we can go further than just saying, yes, there is entanglement, no, there is, is no entanglement. Maybe we can link the amount of information in the um, environment to uh, the level of entanglement in the system. And to this end, I actually propose an entanglement measure, which only works for these classes of evolutions. It fills the requirements for an entanglement measure. It's, it's one of the nice ones, so it's, it can be calculated directly from the density matri ma matrix. Sorry, uh, I was making a plural. And uh, as you will see, it can have really strong computation, uh, computational advantage advantages, but it really provides a direct link between entanglement and information transfer. So it turns out that this um, characteristic for pure dephasing link between amount, the amount of information about the qubit which is in the environment to the amount of qubit environment entanglement Try, translates directly for pure state, from pure states to mixed states, even though the link between entanglement and uh, decoherence does not. Okay, so this is the important bit, the class of problem studies, because this measure is only going to work when our density matri matrix looks like this. You can see my cursor, right? Yes, yes. Okay, so, so we need a density matrix which looks like this. So let's start from the beginning. I have a qubit plus an environment of some dimension n. This, their interaction is given by a Hamiltonian, which is in this class of Hamiltonians, which leads to pure dephasing. And this is a very general form of putting this Hamiltonian. I like it because it's concise, but it can be slightly misleading. This Hamiltonian actually has three parts. It has a qubit part, an environment part, and an interaction. But I can sort of put all these things into these uh, operators which act on the environment. And here you have the qubit part, the free evolution of the environment, and the interaction part is just, I like writing it this way. It's still, it's the standard Hamiltonian, 
for pure dephasing, and just the trick is that your qubit Hamiltonian has to commute with your interaction term, and then you will have pure dephasing. The characteristic thing about this Hamiltonian is that it has um, eigen, eigenstates which are separable. Uh, and because of this, because of this nice form, you can find the evolution operator um, in a slightly less general way than this. You will find the full evolution operator um, that looks like this. And this means that if your qubit is in state zero, this operator tells you what happens on the environment. And if your qubit is in state one, this operator tells you what happens on the environment. And these Ws are what I will be calling conditional evolution operators of the environment. And they look like this. They are gi given by uh, exponents of these parts of the Hamiltonian. So we didn't go very far into making this a specific situation. So, I mean, we have a class of Hamiltonians, but these W operators can be anything. We don't specify we do not need to specify what is happening on the environment. And there's one more thing which is important. I need the initial qubit state to be pure. Once the initial qubit state is not pure, this whole thing becomes a complete mess and I'm sort of halfway to solving it for the last four years or so. Uh, pure yeah, initial... Kasha, sorry, can I ask something? Uh, can you allow in this in this framework, a uh, time-dependent Hamiltonian? Mm, I never tried, but there actually is no reason why not. So, mm -hmm. so yes, I believe so, because it's just a matter, even you would have to have the time dependence in these Vs. You, you couldn't have time dependence here, uh, but if you have time dependence in these Vs, the only thing that would change is that your Ws wouldn't be pretty like this, but would have this integral time ordering and stuff. But from, from the point of view of this formalism, it should work just as well. Thanks. Um, yeah, so I was, as I was saying, this, this, we really need to have this pure initial qubit state, but considering what at least I want to uh, describe, that's not such, a, such a, an unreasonable assumption since well, pure dephasing is relevant usually for solid state qubits where in very many situations it's simply the dominating the decoherence mechanism. And if you have something which you call a qubit and you can't initialize this in a pure state, this means that perhaps you should work on it more. I'm being mean, but I just mean that uh, that um, usually when people start considering something to be a qubit, they have enough control to do, to to prepare a, a pure state. Uh, so when when I was still working more in in realistic open quantum systems, then I could describe the non-pure initial qubit states, but there was never any reason to. Okay, so the state of the environment is arbitrary. There are no limitations on that. And since I need this pure initial qubit state, so my initial state of the qubit and environment is a product state. And then I can use this evolution operator on the initial state and I get the, a very pretty form of the qubit and environment density matrix at time t. And this is written in such a way that, that only the qubit subspace is a matrix form and these uh, Rs are operators which uh, describe what the environment is doing. Uh, so they are the dimension of the environment N. Uh, so here we have this definition of the environmental operators. You get them from the initial state of the environment and these conditional operators of the environment again. And this maybe is relevant, relevant to me, that these R00 uh, operators are actually density matri matrices. So these are, they tell you if your qubit was initialized in state zero, then after time t, your environment would be in state R00. 
and the same if your qubit was initialized, initialized in state one, after time t, your environment would be in state R11. The matrices that stand on the diagonal do not have to be density matrices. Sometimes they are, sometimes they aren't. Okay, so as I said before, I'm just going to uh, state uh, that in case your qubit is initially in a superposition state, any uh, the evolution of this type, of, so this, the state you can get uh, from an evolution of this type is separable at time t if these conditional density matrices of the environment are the same. Obviously, otherwise the qubit is entangled. Completely irrelevant remark that this is also the criterion for zero qubit environment discord. So for these types of evolutions, uh, the discord and entanglement are the same thing. And this has consequences since you can distinguish if you have entanglement or not by performing measurements of the environment, which experimentalists don't want to do for some reason, for some under understandable reason. But you can use this, this physical difference to actually detect if you have this type of entanglement by operations and measurements on the qubit alone. But that, that's a side note, that's, that's our previous result. And this work is from 2020, not 2002. Uh, but I don't want to talk about the witness, I want to talk about the measure. Mm, and as I said, the idea is that if, if you can distinguish if you have an entanglement or not, just because your conditional density matrices of the environment are different, then perhaps how different they are will tell you how much entanglement there is. So to this end, I propose a measure which is written down here. It depends on the initial state of the qubit, which makes sense if, if, the, in, if the qubit state is initially in either of its pointer state zero or one have entanglement. But then this is multiplied by a function which tells you <coughs> how different your qubit and environment are. So to distinguish how different the two density matrices are, we use the fidelity, which gives you zero for states which are as different to each other as can be. So states which have orthogonal supports and one for identical states. So hence the one minus fidelity. Okay, so now as quickly as possible, we want to check if it actually is an entanglement measure. Mm. So first of all, the simple bit is that if this entanglement measure gives you zero, then your state is definitely separable because the state of this form, this is exactly what I had two, two or three slides ago, is separable only if A is equal to zero, B is equal to zero, or these density matrices are the same. And the measure is equal to zero in exactly the same three situations, so the measure uniquely identifies separable states. Then we can show that for initial pure states, it reduces to a known measure of pure bipartite entanglement. So an initial pure state, we already have an initial pure state of the qubit, so we just need an initial pure state of the environment, written in a pretty way here. Mm, and then you can, then the fidelity reduces to, to a nicer formula and the entanglement measure uh, looks like this. And it can be easily shown if you simply find the linear entropy of the reduced density matrix of the qubit that the, uh, that the um, entanglement measure is exactly twice the linear entropy. So it does reduce the known measure of pure bipartite entanglement. Then you need your measure to be invariant under local unitary operations, 
which I will show here in two parts by doing the qubit subspace first and the environmental subspace second. This is also reasonably easy because the fidelity has really nice properties. So first, um, on the qubit subspace, um, a unitary operation on the qubit subspace is equivalent to the rotation of the qubit pointer basis. So if you have this density matrix and you uh, do a unitary operation, uh, well, in the qubit subspace, then you're still going to have the same matrix, just your basis states are going to be different. So you can see that you can still find the entanglement measure and it is going to have the same value. Uh, so the other side in the environmental subspace, if you uh, do a unitary operation on the environment, your density matrix is going to look like this. So nothing happens on the qubit, but the all environmental operators are now sandwiched between those unitary operators on the environment. But luckily the fidelity does not change if you apply symmetrical unitary operations. So the fidelity of this state has to be the same. Uh, so the fidelity between this state and this state has to be the same as the fidelity between R00 and R11. So the measure also does not change under such local unitary operations. Uh, and now the last bit which is required is monotonicity under local operations. And this is slightly more tricky at least in the um, qubit subspace because the measure only exists if you have again this form of the density ma ma matrix. And if you do a local operation on the qubit subspace, you're not going to have this form anymore. The simplest thing which can happen is that these a, b's are going to be multiplied by some number smaller than one, and then it simply doesn't work. You, you lose the form which you have to have. So your measure, I mean my measure, doesn't exist uh, if you do uh, non-unitary local operations on the qubit subspace. It's not going to give you a false number. You simply will not be able to, to find this. On the other hand, when it comes to the environmental subspace, there are no such limitations. It's, you can do anything you want, at least, well, within reason, on the environmental subspace. And if you have a quantum, informa uh, quantum operation, on the environment described by a trace preserving com completely positive map, then it only affects the environmental operators R. And now again, we have the nice properties of the fidelity that it cannot decrease under such operations. And since our measure is proportional to one minus the fidelity, then it cannot increase under such operations. So we are still fine. Natasha, pardon? Mm -hmm. uh, so as far as I understand, uh, you have here a uh, product uh, operation, right? You have a, um, a unitary on qubit because you cannot have anything else. And you have arbitrary CPTP map on, uh, on the environment. Right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. And you cannot... So this is this is the the, 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 the simplest. Uh, it cannot uh, entangle. It cannot actually give you any co extra correlations. Yes. But as far as I understand, it's not even possible to have a uh, correlated um, correlated map. So you have some unitary one uh, complemented by some phi one plus unitary two complemented by some phi two, right? Because this will yes. General keep you out of the pure qubit state which you want to keep. Yes. So, yeah, so I was checking uh, if my entanglement measure can do something stupid. Um, you know, I, I was just checking in its area of applicability, does it, does it um, fulfill the, the requirements for being an entanglement measure? Okay. 
So that's why I, I wasn't generally looking at the properties, but yeah, you're exactly right. I can do one of these things on the qubit and the other on the environment simultaneously. That's not a problem, but I cannot have anything more complicated uh, because uh, I, yeah, because I wasn't even checking for more complicated. It would probably kick me out of this uh, of this form. But moreover, these kind of uh, these kind of operations can also increase entanglement. So I wasn't interested. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's just just a comment that usually one of the hardest things to prove for entanglement measure is that it does not increase under LLCC. Yeah, but here, uh, here you, you somehow, it's not applicable to your situation because LOCC is a way too big uh, class of operations. Uh, yes, so, so one of the things is that once you, so L LOCC is definitely, um, I'm trying not to curse, really hard to check. <laughs> Uh, if you do not have uh, a product form at the beginning. Um, so this, this thing here somewhere, this, the fact that we have an initial product state made checking LCC easy. That's because then, then it's, then you know what to do. So just take, take uh, prescriptions and check. But if you could have any initial state and it wouldn't have to be a product, product form, then I'm not, I refuse to check it. Um, so anyway, this, this, it turns out that it is a measure, but it's not a general measure. It's a measure that works for stuff, for these pure defacing things with pr initial product form and with pure state of the environment. I went too far. Okay. So now we come to the slightly controversial bit uh, because it does turn out that the, that the measure has, um, well, there are states for which the measure can be one. And for these states are um, either maximally entangled states for, pure maximally entangled states that we know and love that they look like Bell states. But there are also other states for which the, the maximum value is reached. So to reach the maximum value, which is one, you need fidelity to be equal to zero and you need the initial state to be an equal superposition state. So for fidelity to be equal to zero, you need the product of R0, zero, zero and R11 to be equal to zero. And this is what me and Jarek called strict orthogonality when we were looking at these kind of evolutions in the context of, of uh, what's it called? Objectivity. So it turns out that it's, it's important. So I, I saw this form before when we were looking at that because to get the full information about, the, about your qubit from the environment, you would actually need this kind of condition to be fulfilled. And it's, well, it's, it's, it's pretty hard to get that, but it is possible. So I wanted to know in terms of entanglement, maybe in terms of entanglement measured by uh, something more standard, what's, what, are these, what are these states that have these A, equal to b equal to one divided by square root of two and the strict orthogonality fulfilled. So quite surprising to me, it actually turned out that this is exactly the same set of states for which I would get the maximum value using any convex, convex roof entanglement measure, such as entanglement of formation, which is pretty standard. And now the next two pages are the proof of this. So to, to prove this, I'm going to have to change notations because otherwise uh, it becomes a mess. So the first thing I do is write my R0, 0 matrix. It's the density matrix of the environment at time t if the qubit would be in state zero. And I write it in a diagonal form. It has to have a diagonal form. And then if I write it 
in the diagonal form and define this weird kind of um, evolution operator, which is a product of the two conditional evolution operators, then I can write all the other three matrices in terms of this matrix R00. You will see in a moment that it's very convenient. And the other thing I defined is states n perpendicular. And a state n perpendicular is what you get if you act with this operator W on one of the eigenstates of R00. So before we go on, there is one, um, there is one condition which I would like to note, which again we found before with Jarek doing this. And this is, if you want R00 times R11 to be equal to zero, then these states have to live in sort of different subspaces of the uh, Hilbert space of the environment. So each eigenstate of this ma matrix has to be orthogonal and different from each eigenstate of this density matrix. And uh, since these matrices don't change so much during the evolutions, they, their eigenvalues remain the same and the only thing that, and they start from the same thing, and the only thing that changes are, um, are these eigen, eigen states. For this strict orthogonality condition to be fulfilled, your initial state has to have one half, at most one half non-zero eigenvalues from what it could have. So the condition is that the initial purity of the environment must be at least twice as large as the minimum purity of the environment, otherwise such a condition may never be fulfilled during this evolution. Okay, so now let's take this, let's insert the diagonal form of R00 into all of these formulas and let's, uh, let's write all four of these matrices in terms of states n and n perpendicular. If we have the strict orthogonality condition fulfilled, then each state go away. Then each state n, uh, that then each state n has to be perpendicular to n perpendicular, hence the name. But this is implied by, by the orthogonality condition. This is not something which is fulfilled at all times during the evolution. So this means that states n and states n perpendicular form an orthonormal basis if you have the strict orthogonality. Okay, so now we can write our R0, 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 R11, R01, and R10 in terms of n and n perpendicular. These terms are, um, well, have both. And if you do that, you can uh, order everything in such a way that you get a very nice and concise form of your full qubit environment density matrix where these states, these CNs are still the same eigenvalues which are everywhere here, but these states psi n are given, well, by this formula. Um, and each state psi n lives in a different subspace of the environment because they're labeled by n and n and n perpendicular or perpendicular to each other and this n states n are a different sub subset of the Hilbert of the environmental uh, Hilbert states than these states n perpendicular. So we're dealing with maximally entangled bipartite states, these ones, of Bell type, obviously, but each one of them lives in a in a different uh, subspace. And now, I don't know if any of you ever tried to do the convex roof construction for a, for an um, entanglement measure by hand. It's usually um, something you don't do. Or if you decide to do this, you have better pray that you have two really small systems and you still give it to someone who is good with computers and someone you don't like very much. 
But in this special case where our states are like this, it actually becomes easy to do and you can do it by hand. The trick is that if you, because the, again, the convex roof constructions means that you just take the average with the proper probabilities of uh, your pure state decomposition of the density ma matrix, but you have to minimize this over all possible decompositions of the density matrix into pure states, and there's an infinite number of, of those, and they get more and more complica complicated the bigger your system is. Uh, but the trick is that each state in, the, in, in any decomposition, so each psi i, regardless of what it is, has to be a superposition of well, any other, of states from any other decomposition, so also from the orthogonal set of states which diagonalize your ma matrix, so these states. So this means that I can write any state psi i even though I don't really know what the decomposition is, so here we have state psi i as some superposition of my, so this is phi, of my psi n states. So the ones I have here, the ones that are maximally entangled and live in different subspaces. So if I do this and I make some order, I can see that I have an equal superposition of the zero state of the qubit and some state of the environment which is written only on states from one half of the Hilbert space of the environment plus one times a superposition of states from the other uh, sub subspace of this Hilbert space. So this means that if I find the entanglement of this state, it is always going to be one. So this means that if I make a uh, weight average over these states, whatever it was and whatever these averages are, I will always get one. So this means that if I take my state, which my entanglement measure says that it has maximal entanglement, and then I take entanglement of formation, and I find the entanglement of formation for this, it's also going to tell me that it, that this gives me the maximum value of entanglement of formation. I was kind of surprised because I'm used to the notion that um, maximally entangled, bipartite maximally entangled states have to be pure. Um, but these states definitely do not have to be pure. And then I searched some literature and it turned out that uh, somebody already found this in 2012. I was actually more interested in the measure, so this was like a pretty cool side result. Um, and uh, well, it is, is, it is sort of cool and I was kind of surprised that, that I didn't hear of this. So I started looking at why do we all think that, well, maybe not all I did and my referees did, um, why it's, it's commonly believed that bipartite maximally entanglement states have to be pure. And I, I found the, the, the source of this, but they actually never said this in this, in this uh, paper. What they actually find is exactly the same set of conditions which they find in this paper above in 2012. But instead of, uh, well, they didn't find examples of such states, but they stated, and I quote from the paper, that they believe that the existence of an n-dimensional subspace formed only by maximally entangled states is a very demanding condition. So for, the, so that for general convex entangled measures, the maximally entangled states are pure. So, uh, yeah, so they didn't actually prove and they also did not state that all maximally entangled states have to be pure. And here in this work, if you're interested, they, they made a very, very uh, thorough analysis of uh, the classes of mixed states, which actually can have this, can have this uh, uh, 
uh, this condition and they also show that you can do teleportations on them or something like that. I've, I found it interesting, but but it was still the, the, the Chinese work is, uh, well, it's more true quantum information than I am. So they're, they're just looking at, at mathematical properties of some states. Um, whereas I have seen that some, that these type of states can come up in, in regular evolutions. I see I really need to uh, fast forward. So um, why would you want to use my measure if you can use negativity? The answer is that in general, uh, Finding this measure requires the diagonalization of matrices of half the size than those which you have to uh, diagonalize to find negativity. This is an advantage, but it's not huge. But once you have a situation where um, your environmental density matrices have a product form with respect to different components of the environment, which is actually also quite common and a very decent, a very decent approximation, very many solid state qubits. This happens where you have no initial cor correlations in the environment and you give your Hamiltonian looks like this. Um, I mean, your Hamiltonian is a sum of terms which each, each uh, describes the, um, each component of the environment separately then this gives you absolutely nothing when you want to find negativity. You still have to diagonalize something which is just as big as, as when you don't have this property. But when it comes to computing the fidelity, then it becomes really easy because you can find the fidelity of each component separately. So instead of having to diagonalize one big matrix, matrix you have to diagonalize many little ones and this is a completely different computational problem so i have some i have some results i just took a qubit in an environment of k qubits so i call this environment spins um i have an equal superposition qubit states i choose the in the um, I choose the um, interaction to be asymmetric in such a way that only one of my conditional evolution operators is is equal is not equal to one to unity, and I choose this in such a way that this interaction can will uh, repeatedly give me a, a maximum entangled state if if I have uh, an environment of a single qubit. Um, okay, so the f then I'm going to have a lot of these sp spins and for the most part they will all have the same initial state and the, this is sort of especially chosen in such a way that if I have the same number of um, initial spins, then the coherence um, does not depend on uh, the initial state of the environment, which, which is nice because the amount of entanglement definitely depends on the initial state of the environment, but I will always have the same, the same decoherence. Uh, yeah, and I can, I can diagonalize this exactly. Uh, so this was a fast slide because I'm almost out of time. So here we have a picture of the time evolution uh, of qubit environment entanglement uh, quantified by this measure uh, for each environmental spin in the same, uh, same initial state. And we have a range of coupling constants which somehow depend on, on, the, on K, so on the number of qubits. And you can see this pretty picture. This is for 10 qubits, which means that the Hilbert space of the environment is uh, about a thousand. And here you can see I'm changing. So this red line shows you the decoherence, which is all, always the same. It doesn't depend on this initial state, but I'm changing the initial state of the uh, environment. And uh, depending on this initial state, the purer 
the state the initial state of the environment is the more uh the more entanglement i get this is to be expected somehow but it's still the the point is uh that i can get these results on my laptop and that they last a fraction of a second so then i did the same thing but i chose the same initial state of the environment and then i started going into more and more ridiculous numbers of qubits so the biggest one is the yellow curve here we have a growing number of qubits so the decoherence changes these curves here are the decoherence curves the wavy curves to the right are um are entanglement curves and here i have an uh, 80 qubits which means that my size of the environment is of the order of 10 to the 24th if i ask someone to calculate this well you can imagine what would happen but here because the fidelity is such a nice function i do not have to diagonalize something this size i need to diagonalize something which is the or which is a two times two matrix 80 times and this this i can simply do so once you are in this situation and you know there is no reason for me to stop at 80. i can do whatever i want with this mm, so I, I think I missed it. Uh, what are the two types of curves that, sh that you have here? One is a nicely Gaussian decrease and another one is increase. I got lost for a moment. This is, uh, so I have the time evolution of entanglement and these are these increasing curves. And this is the accompanying decoherence. So it's the evolution of the models of the... Of diagonal here. element of the qubit density matrix. Okay, got it. Thanks. Okay, and so the next slide just shows that I can also um, obtain situations where I have maximum entanglement at some point. I mean, my entanglement measure is equal to one at these points, and this I actually find found quite surprising because to have this. I need to have one spin which is initially in a pure state. I was expecting to the to have um, bigger restrictions on this to get well this entanglement measure equal to one for mixed states, and I was actually expecting to have to have these subspaces of the environment at least of the uh, of the di dimension four. But it actually turns out, this is again the fidelity for you, uh, that my intuitions were incorrect, that I can still have qubits, just all of them are mixed and one of them is, is in a pure state, and I will have these repeated points. These are just different curves for different parameters, but I will have these repeating points where I actually have this entanglement equal to one. Uh, okay. So with this, I would like to conclude that I constructed a measure uh, for entangled, which is strictly tailored for the study of these pure dephasing evolutions. And it definitely shows that this type of entanglement is proportional to the amount of information about the qubit present in the environment, uh, but not uh, to decoherence. And for some situations, the measure, the measure, it always has at least a slight computation advantage over negativity, but for some situation, the computation advantage can be huge up to the point that you can calculate within fractions of a second something which you simply would not be able to compute, uh, to find because, you know, the world would end. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Kasia. Um, so, uh, questions. Uh, there were some questions already during the talk, um, but right now I open discussion. I'm sorry for the 18 slides of formulas. Well, that's okay. We are at the end of repetitions here, no? <laughs>
you should be certainly used to that. Uh, so I, uh, I I I have a question because you are comparing to uh, negativity. Uh, first of all, it's it's uh, amazingly how uh, uh, computationally easy your measure is. I mean, this is sort of uh, shocking that that you can have uh, eighty qubits and calculate uh, the measure on on a laptop. That's uh, that I think that's, that's really fast. But uh, since you are comparing to negativity, uh, don't you think that some of the computational advantages that you are mentioning may come from the fact that this measure is what I was trying to say, that it doesn't, um, uh, it, you, you don't need the LOCC non-monotonicity. Mm -hmm. So the computational advantage definitely comes from the fact that this is a measure which does not work generally. And I assume this is the same thing you're saying, just in a different way. Yes, I think, I think so, this yeah. is what I'm trying to say, because negativity, uh, we all have to live with it somehow. But uh, one thing about negativity is its uh, universality and fairly easy uh, computability com compared to the other measures of, uh, of entanglement. But as far as I understand, what you have found here is that you have a, a, a tailor cut measure for for the specific situation, which is just like you know, orders of magnitude uh, better in the sense of being faster computable than than negativity. Yes, yes, I'm I'm definitely not see, saying that this can work in general. I'm saying that this can work in this very specific situation. But once you have this specific situation, and I, as I said, these types of Hamiltonians are pretty common, then... Yeah, obviously, obviously this, is, this is the most, uh, the most like, Hamiltonian which you started from, as far as I understand, this is the most, uh, first of all, the most uh, general uh, purity phasing uh, Hamiltonian. Yes. Uh, yeah. Plus, it has uh, wide applications in, in, in quantum dots, right? This is what you thought. Mm -hmm. Uh, Kasia, and you have a, you have a similar set of works where you substitute a qubit with a general, more general system. Yeah. So can you think of um, um, obtaining some sort of similar results for a say general spin or spin one system instead of qubit? It should be possible. The only problem is that when you have a more general system, you have more, you have more, um, in case of a qubit, this is your one if and only if separability condition. If your system is bigger, you have, let's say you have states zero, one, and two. You will have three conditions of this type so, you know, with zero, zero on the left, one, one on the right, one, one, two, two, and two, two, zero, zero. So you already have three, but the bigger problem is that you also uh, have one extra set of conditions, which is of different type. This uh, commutativity conditions, right? Mm -hmm. If I remember correctly. Yeah. And it's, it's problematic to write them down in a, such a neat form as you have done with uh, state fidelities and uh, R00, R1. Yes. So the qubit is special. The qubit is special mostly because it only has one of diagonal element and this makes everything easy. Uh, that's why there is actually, <coughs> it's actually quite common and I understand why this happens that people study the properties of entanglement on two qubits and then assume that the properties of entanglement or whatever are going to be similar once you have at least one bigger system. But the problem is that the qubit is really special. Um, and once you start having even one bigger system, once you start having two bigger systems, that there are quite a lot of things which are completely counterintuitive in terms of what you know from the study of two qubits. So it's, it becomes a mess. But I think it should be possible. I mean, I know the conditions. 
Yeah, exactly, because you have the conditions uh, at hand, right? Yep. Okay, um, any other questions, anyone? I have one technical question, like on the operational side, I think from- uh, Michal, can you please move closer to the mic because now you sound like uh, from a barrel. Now is it better? <laughs> uh, marginally better. Marginally. You're very quiet, Michal. That's very weird. Just no. shout, man, now, shout. Maybe now? Not really, you are quite muffled. Stop listening to Yarek and ask the question. <laughs> right, you're just smoking me, man. Okay. <laughs> so, the question. so what I wanted to ask is that, like, from an operational point of view, it, it makes sense not only to say if something is entangled or not, but maybe how close a given set of, like, a given state is to the set of entangled states. In terms of something that's you know, has some like, you know, you can connect to observable quantities. So, so I'm talking like diamond norm or like some other measure of distance on this, like trace distance on the set of quantum states. So your measure, does it upper bound, uh, does it, is it like, can, can you connect it to, to like distance to, to the, can you so, use upper or lower bound the distance to the set of observable states? Mm, so it's an entanglement measure. So in principle, yes, it does. It does, I guess, tell you how far you are. I mean, you know, more entanglement or less entanglement in principle tells you how far you are in term from the set of separable states. But this, well, I meant, I meant trace distance because it's kind of I, I some, can some measurable thing. So the the problem with with actually making a measure um, that exactly that that checks how far you are from the set of uh, set of separable states is that you need to minimize stuff, and once you minimize stuff um, over anything which is big. After after one experience, I refuse to minimize anything that has two qubits. So anything bigger is just it's no. But the the so so this is this walks around this sort of. So I, I check all these properties and it is a measure. So if you have two values of this entanglement measure and one is smaller than the other, then it does tell you that the one that has a smaller value of this measure has to be closer to the set of, of, of um, separable states. But, um, mm, but yeah, I do not I mean, check for, that. Just for some, for some indicators or measures, like some relations to trace distance or to time was not there, just known. And like, I was wondering, given the structure of the problem, maybe it's possible. Just mm. Nah, I'm. I'm. Really a I could uh, please, try. I, I comment, it should be possible, you know, because of the fidelity. Yes, and there uh, are there are known bounds on fidelity and trace distances. But this is the fidelity between something else. I mean, I know that this yeah, looks like yeah. Bohr's distance, but it's not, because the difference is the structure is exactly the same, but I'm looking at how different two density matrices of the environment are. If you want this to be something like Bohr's distance, then it will look the same with the exception of this, I guess. But here you would have this a separable state, and here you would have this whole state sigma. And then you would have to minimize. Uh, actually, I, I, yeah, I, I understand what you are saying, but I think when we are um, asking about the distance to separable states, we have in mind a separable state, but of a special form, because only then your measure is applicable. And then, of course, I might be wrong, but I have a suspicion that if you take a trace distance between two states of uh, your specific form, then by some manipulations, perhaps you can, you can bound it from both below and, and above by some expressions containing the F of us. Uh, it's my, just my rough guess. 
It's possible, but in, in general, it could be tried and it's always easier because of this special form, but still <clears throat> you would be dealing with this whole matrix here. And uh, yeah, this matrix is not so nice. It's nicer than a general matrix. Uh, but if you have, um, if you write the set of separable states of this type, what you get is that R0, 0 is equal to R11, but there are some others. It would be easier than doing this in general, uh, but I'm not sure what you would get. Okay. Uh, and this right off, yeah. minimization is not fun. Mm -hmm. So just, okay, just, so, so okay, I, I, it's not a critique or like it's just a comment. Like, sure. like so, sometimes structure can really help a lot, even for huge, huge systems. Mm -hmm. I, I just wanted to, like, so, okay, just, just a, okay, just in terms of this entanglement theory or like any, like resource theory stuff. Just, okay, it's nice to connect to those quantifiers like based on distances because they, mm -hmm. not because this is some abstract stuff, but just because they, uh, they relate to how different outcomes of any measurements that you are performing on your system mm -hmm. actually are like, like, like compared to like separable states, like, uh, and, uh, yeah, what, what, what can I say? Like, and, uh, okay, once I, I did like a problem that like had zillions like degrees of freedom in some sense, and in some sense, su surprisingly enough, it was possible to find some, mm -hmm. some state, the closest separable, it was actually like symmetric state. It had like many, many variables, but due to the symmetry or like, Actually, it's possible. It, it's actually, it, it never crossed my mind, but, but it actually, uh, you may be right that it's, that it's doable here. Just because you also have this special state, is, uh, well, the, the, the set of separable states also has a special form. But I don't know. There would, we would have to sit down and look. Okay, um, any more questions, comments? Hey, you guys are still quite lively considering that this is an online seminar. <laughs> uh, well, thank you. <laughs> what can I say? Thank you, Kasia. <laughs> Uh, okay, if, uh, if there are no more questions and comments, uh, I propose to thank Kasia for a very nice uh, talk.